All right, Mr. CT, if you're ready to go, let's get you up. Okay, <clears throat> thanks, Bruce. And uh, sorry for uh, falling out of the Zoom teleconference where you're giving me uh, all the good rev up there at the beginning of the meeting. Um, for some reason, two sessions of PowerPoint started up. And when that happens on this computer anyway, that prevents me from changing slides. So we didn't want that. So let's try to share the screen here and see how this works. Uh, Bill, you need to change your name there. What is my name? It's Patrick Gooden. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, well, I'd rather proceed with... <laughs> That's what I get for logging in with your account there the other time. Uh, <laughs> please indulge me that. I'd rather uh, get started here. Uh, let's see. Everybody see the um, screen share? You're up. You're good. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Bill K1CT presenting. Uh, yes, I'm not Patrick Goodman. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> good of it uh thank you patrick for uh allowing us to use your account there for the convert 220 club uh meetings which we just held on thursday and that's what's happened the, the zoom teleconference app has remembered patrick's identity rather than mine well <laughs> but we'll see what we can do about that so we're going to talk about nvis near vertical incident skywave uh operations uh this was requested by one of our members i um uh, don't remember who, but Rob does because he asked me to uh, put this presentation on as he was indicating before getting the uh, local talent in here to make the presentations. If you have any follow up questions, please write down my email address. It's real easy. My call sign K1CT at AWRL.net. I'd be happy to uh, respond to any questions and do the Elmer mentoring thing here. Let me move this out of my way so I can see my own slides. So their vertical instant skywave is a communications technique uh, which uses uh, the ionospheric layers uh, overhead to uh, basically bounce the signals back down to earth uh, to provide short and medium range um, communications on HF. This is an HF uh, uh, band uh, interest item. So uh, it's hard to define exactly what the ranges would be. I have on the slide here 25 to 200 miles. Some might take it out a bit further than 200 miles. But the key issue is, is that you're doing so with no skip zone. What is a skip zone? Uh, important to understand that concept. Uh, when you send a radio wave out to the uh, ionosphere at a low angle, it uh, bounces back down again and comes back down to Earth at a certain distance. Uh, it might be hundreds of miles, maybe a thousand miles or more. And uh, the skip zone is that intervening distance between where the ground wave ends and where the sky wave, that signal that bounced off the ionosphere, comes back down. And that may be tens or hundreds of miles, maybe even a thousand miles of um, area where the signal cannot be heard or not be heard very well. So, uh, that's what uh, uh, that would be the conventional uh, kind of operations where you're bouncing your signals off the off the ionosphere to get sky waves to reach out to long distances and achieve DX. Well, for ARS, we aren't looking at DX. <laughs> We're looking at trying to get from places like East County, uh, Imperial County, uh, back over here to the coast, and be able to keep, communicate everywhere in between. Hey, and Bill, so your, your slides are not changing. Yeah, I'm a, I'm still on the same uh, slide. Okay. So I'm, I'm probably uh, elaborating more than my slide talks about. So uh, what we do is we're using uh, the lower HF bands, uh, 160 meters to 30 meters. And um, under periods of high sunspot cycle, such as we are in right now, you can actually uh, go higher than that. Um, Amazingly, uh, 20 meters uh, NVIS <laughs> does happen. I've actually seen it up on 17 meters. I've been able to bounce over to uh, Borrego Springs on 17 meters, but it's not something that, that happens that often. It's only usually for a, a very short period of time during the day, like in the early afternoon. So NVIS is used as a backup to our VHF and UHF repeater comms. VHF and UHF repeaters up on mountaintops or other prominent features depend on power uh, to run. 
And if uh, they don't have a good battery backup, they can be lost in the event of a fire burning down power poles or earthquake, uh, disrupting the power lines, that sort of thing. And so having NVIS on HF as a backup to that is really key. And of course, anytime you have a backup, you want to exercise that capability. So that's why we have our HF nets on uh, the weekend, on Sundays, uh, to be able to remind ourselves uh, how to use uh, HF modes and exercise our equipment and our operating skills and so on. So voice and data can be supported by NVIS. And uh, we regularly do all those on Sunday morning. So let's find out some more. So I uh, already touched a little bit about this, uh, this uh, little diagram. Okay, Bill. Yes, sir. Yeah, so most of us are only just seeing your title slide because when you share, you got to share, you shared you got to share the presentation when you go full screen. Oh, it's not moving. Oh, okay. That's what David was trying to say. How about now? There we go. Yeah, I've, I've seen this problem before, and I'm not sure how to overcome it. Um, we'll try to do the best we can with that. Okay. Sorry, Dave. I thought you were seeing my slide. <laughs> my other slide. No, I haven't said that you were stuck on the first one. And that's, oh, uh, got that's it, got it. what well, I was trying to explain. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I I thought I was elaborating too much on that one slide. Sorry, so we'll go this way. Sorry, it's going to be a little smaller, but uh, I have yet to figure out how to get the presentation mode to advance through Zoom. Have another cup of coffee. Another cup of coffee. <laughs> that's right. So uh, why do NVIS? The idea is, is to... Uh, have good quality signals over that range of uh, roughly, uh, <coughs> excuse me, close in to about 200 miles or so out. Another goal is you want and be able to fill in everywhere in between with no skip zone. And the other thing is to reject distant signals. Um, those DX signals coming in by low elevation sky waves or something that's for somebody uh, operating here in the San Diego section, uh, hearing folks in Texas, for example, uh, they aren't participating in your drill or your emergency, and so you would like to minimize their signal level so you can reuse the frequencies. And uh, maybe not such a deal for amateur radio, but uh, minimizing detectability by using NVIS techniques, if you use them right, uh, somebody from a thousands of miles away isn't going to be able to hear your activity. So that's uh, one goal. Military cares about such things, but we won't talk any further about that. So um, I like this slide because this uh, showerhead coverage area slide um, shows, once again, no uh, skip zone. We have normally a horizontal antenna focusing its energy upwards, and it all just comes showering back down in all directions from the ionosphere. So the amplitudes uh, are relatively constant. Uh, in other words, they aren't fading so much. and uh, uh, and the other aspect of this is that uh, if you're 10 miles away or if you're uh, 50 miles away, the amplitude is going to be about the same because it's really making the round trip from the ground up to the ionosphere, which may be 100 miles or more up and back down again. So the distance is all about the same, no matter how much how what your distance uh, is on the ground. Well, let's... Uh, get ourselves situated with the history in VIS, probably started to be used during World War II. And here are some examples of that. Uh, on the top, uh, the uh, Wehrmacht, uh, the German army, uh, had th this vehicle here. And you see the apparatus on the top. I think my cursor will work, as I pointed out up there. That's the NVIS antenna. Watch out for headaches <laughs> from the RF exposure, but uh, using NVS there. And there's the U.S. Army version of putting the antenna, looks like uh, some skis, on top of the van there. Uh, we move forward in time. Vietnam, uh, the uh, M60 uh, Jeep here with the um, whip on the back. They found out it actually worked better for most of their communications by tying a rope onto it and twisting the antenna down so that it enhanced the high angle radiation. And uh, here's a version of the uh, the Soviet uh, NVIS uh, portable uh, mobile operation with the half loop antenna 
on top of their uh, communication box there. So this has been used, like I say, during World War II, Vietnam and the Cold War, and of course, during the uh, various anti-terrorism thing uh, efforts in the Middle East, Afghanistan, and so on. And we continue to use this. Uh, here's from the Yuma Ham Fest. Uh, one of the rare times when it was actually raining out there, you can see from the ground, uh, the Civil Air Patrol, the CAP, uh, was uh, showing off their communications vehicle here with a bent over antenna pointing out there, which they used to enhance the uh, high angle radiation so they could do NVIS. NVIS is not only used for two-way communications, it's also used for broadcast. And one of the uh, stories I like to tell about this is uh, there is actually some specific uh, shortwave broadcast bands which are meant to enhance uh, NV uh, NVIS operations. The 120, 90, and 60 meter shortwave broadcast bands, uh, that's what they're specifically meant for. And uh, in Cuba, the uh, Fidel Castro and Che Guevara's uh, insurgent army uh, used ham radio equipment on NVIS to uh, run their broadcast transmitter, and it's still running today in the 60 meter uh, area around uh, 5,025 kilohertz come from Cuba. This is ideal for Cuba because its uh, size is just about right. You can do NV NVIS over the entire island from one location, and of course it's mountainous, and so this is perfect for filling in there. So. Uh, it has applicability for more than just two-way communications, but also the broadcast. So the basic philosophy of NVIS is you want to operate up near the critical frequency, which is known as the FOF2 uh, frequency for the ordinary wave off the F2 layer of the ionosphere. And on this um, uh, slide here, uh, you get a idea of where the FOF2 changes during the course of the day. During the daylight hours, it's up here, and then during the night it goes down, the sun comes up, ionizes the ionosphere, and goes up here. These, The vertical scale is frequency, and the horizontal scale is time of day. So this is nighttime here, and these are on the sides are, are the daytime. So uh, the other uh, dynamic there, what's happening during the daytime is the D layer also gets ionized. And the D layer accounts for very little for propagation as far as getting your waves, uh, your transmissions from point A to point B. It really acts as a, a blanket of absorption. And the more ionized it is, as you'll see right around midday, actually just after noontime, is uh, the point in time when the absorption is the highest. So it forces, that absorption forces you to go higher in frequency uh, to be able to get away from that absorption and get your signals up to the level uh, required to uh, communicate reliably. So um, uh, one illustration of this is uh, ARES used to uh, support, uh, and we still do support for that matter, um, the San Diego 100 mile runs and uh, other uh, endurance runs out in the, East County, about around Mount Laguna and such areas. And uh, we used to do this on uh, NVIS HF, uh, in addition to, uh, or instead of uh, VHF and UHF repeaters. Uh, for a couple of years, we used 160 meters and it worked just great during the morning. Uh, and it worked just great during the evening. But during midday, the delay absorption got so bad, the signals would just go way down. Of course, the other dynamic is, is that out there in East County is that you oftentimes uh, get uh, thunderstorms and those uh, result in uh, lightning, which results in radio noise, which increases the noise floor, which uh, disrupts your communications. So we learned that uh, you, you need more than just 160 meters <laughs> from that. So I, I thought it'd be useful to go through and compare uh, on a given day, at a given time, how the various ham bands would uh, work as far as NVIS communications based on modeling from the VOACAP program. Uh, the VOACAP is a free program you can download off the internet and you can play with this yourself. Uh, the key thing to keep in mind is, is that you need to uh, 
besides just putting in your frequency, you need to track what the sunspot number is. And today it's over 200, by the way, which is really high. So our uh, uh, predictions for today will be different than what is being shown here in these slides. Uh, these are done on a sunspot number of 100. First off, we start with 160 meters. And you can see in the middle there, this is our NVIS coverage for 160 meters. Well, what's happening at middle of the day on 160 meters, we already talked about it, is that the D layer absorption is high. And so our NVIS coverage is very, very small, but not insignificant. I mean, it covers the Western part of the San Diego County pretty well, all the way up to Orange County or maybe even a bit beyond. But uh, uh, that gives you a sense for what's happening. And this is a low horizontal antenna on 160 meters. And we all know that 160 meters, typically you would be using a high horizontal antenna or a vertical antenna. And uh, those would give you some ground wave. These predictions on VOACAP do not consider the ground wave. So in this case, the ground wave is probably bigger than the sky wave uh, distance. But I uh, like to say that it's a separate modeling program to show that. So that's not shown here. That's speculation. So we move up to 75 meters where we run our Sunday morning net. We start mm -hmm. off on 3905 kilohertz. And um, the white area here is uh, reasonably strong signals, and then they fade out as you get further away. And then the pink is basically no signal. Uh, unfortunately, a uh, VOA cap changes its colors every time you run it. So the colors on one slide are not the same meaning as the next one. So I'll have to explain them each time. So uh, we have pretty good NVIS coverage. We uh, cover uh, a lot of the area we're interested in on 75 meters. This is at a sunspot uh, number of 100. And uh, like I say, during midday, an antenna up about an eighth of a wavelength. Going to 60 meters. We get greater coverage, and still we have, as was on 75 meters, the center part here is our best signal strength, and there's no drop out here due to a skip zone in the middle. Watch the next bands, and you might see something like that happen. So we've been running uh, 60 meters in addition to our 75 meter uh, roll call on the net on Sunday uh, to basically uh exercise the 60 meter capability and compare the results between 75 meters and 60 meters and yes the d layer absorption is normally less on 60 and uh so the signals tend to be uh better but not always and that's a, a good thing to understand the more you use it the more you understand moving to 40 meters uh during low sunspot cycles for nvis propagation we don't normally do much at 40 meters uh but uh, with the uh, reasonably high sunspot numbers, uh, it's working well. We still have white as the strong signals, and we're covering NV, uh, IS all the way up to Bay Area and halfway down Baja and into Arizona. And 30 meters. Like I say, with a reasonably good sunspot number, you can actually do NVS on 30 meters. And this shows that can uh, still has the high signal strength. White is still the high level. And uh, there's no dropout in the middle. Now things start to change. We moved up to 40 meters. And our signals yellow is down on the slider here. Is It's still a signal you can probably use maybe. <laughs> but the good strong signals are out here. And you notice this would be what we would call sort of the skip zone here. Moving up to 17 meters. In this case, the color has really changed. In here, there's no signal. The blue in the middle is no signal. And the white is way out here, which is the high signal. So the, this area in here is all the skip zone. No usable signals or marginal signal quality. And 15 meters, it just gets more like that. See our white, white area out here is way out. And finally on 10 meters, we're, we get nowhere <laughs> because we're above the uh, uh, maximum usable frequency. So that gives you a sense of how the uh, 
skywave propagation varies from band to band. So how do we do a NVIS effectively? Well, first off is determine our critical frequency, which we get off the internet. And I'll show you some places to get those. And uh, once again, that's known as the FOF2, the frequency of the ordinary way bouncing off the F2 layer of the ionosphere. We need to be able to be prepared for uh, having frequencies pre-designated uh, and being agile to be able to adapt to the different periods, uh, different times of the day. And selecting an antenna is key because we really care about getting a high angle radiation to be able to uh, get that shower head effect of bouncing off directly up and directly back down again, rather than trying to uh, send a wave out at low angle, which is gonna go a long ways away and not serve us. So having a, a plan to do this, and of course, practicing it, uh, gains us our proficiency in doing it. I'm showing uh, these uh, FOF2 uh, prediction charts here uh, from a program which unfortunately uh, has sort of been abandoned, but it allows us an opportunity to um, see this. And it's because of the small size of the display. Uh, you can see these lines here equate to the frequencies at that particular location uh, for the FOF2. and it's really hard to read, but right there is 17 megahertz, and over there is about 11. So that's 10, 9, 8, around 7 megahertz ish uh, for San Diego in that case. Uh, these have been replaced by a better display, which I'll show later on, which is what we use now, because they turned each of these contour lines. Uh, into a uh, colored band, and that's much easier to read. So you can see from the um, various samples shown here that um, uh, the FOF2 varies, or the correct selection for uh, NVIS varies according to the season of the year and the year. And so on the April 26, 2011, the FOF uh, the calculated, which is about 80 to 100 percent of the critical frequency, uh, we would want to use something in the 6.8 to 8.5 megahertz region, so 40 meters would be our best choice at that particular time on that date. Three years later, almost, it's a bit higher because we were playing up the sunspot cycle. We could use uh, uh, critical or the uh, NVIS frequencies of, uh, that we calculate best would be 8.4 to 10.5 megahertz, and so we would want to think about using 30 meters. But if we needed to use voice, we couldn't use 30 meters because there's no voice privileges there. So we'd have to use 40. So uh, the intent here was to show a little exercise of what is the NVS frequency that we would want to use. This curve here is 11, 10, 9, 8, 7 ish, right over Southern California. So seven. We might be able to get away with 40 meters, but like I say, um, somewhere around 80 to 100% of the critical frequency is where we'd want to place our signal to get maximum spacing away from the D-layer absorption, but we don't want to go too high and, and uh, punch through the ionosphere basically and, and not come back down again. So um, 40 meters might be good, but it's probably right on the edge. Uh, 60 meters would be awesome, and so uh, that would probably be the best band to use for that. Of course, 60 meters has its own restrictions. It's channelized, not a lot of room there. And to some extent, it's not available for all modes. I think we've gone through the exercise enough, so we'll just go on to the next slide here. Uh-oh. Uh well, thank you, Windows. I needed that. Hopefully, you're not seeing that. Uh, the NVI's handband a clock here is kind of an interesting thing I found on the internet. Uh, mm -hmm. This shows how the best NVIS band varies according to the day. So sunrise, it's showing showing 80 meters starts off, moving to 60 meters, and then during the peak time of the day, uh, 40 meters back to 60 meters, back to 80 meters, and then overnight, it's 160 meters. And of course, this. NVIS band clock thing 
is going to be dependent upon the solar cycle, your location, the season of the year. All those things matter. And this particular one was built for folks up in the uh, northern part of the Midwest. And their typical uh, critical frequencies are lower. And we have down here at the uh, mid latitudes. And you'll see that uh, in the ionospheric uh, FOF2 contours. When I get to that, they'll be a lot easier to read than those older charts. So um, once again, uh, going back to some of the uh, TTP, as we call it, tactics, techniques, and procedures. Uh, we want to determine the optimal band. We want to be uh, able to use that band and uh, the one above and one below it to be optimum. Because one thing to keep in mind, and I uh, indicate this in the last slides of the presentation, is that in addition to achieving propagation, we are also uh, having to consider the local noise level. And these days, with more and more noise coming from things like lamp dimmers, solar panels, which we discussed last time, uh, plasma TVs, uh, grow lights, you name it, it's out there. Internet distribution is the bane of my neighborhood, uh, is that you might have an optimum band uh, as far as propagation is concerned, but you may have a very high noise level there. And that frequently is the case for me, especially during the evening. Uh, so you're really shooting for best signal to noise ratio because that's what your ear hears is the signal over the noise. So uh, this is all well and good to predict what the best frequency is, but you want to be able to have agility to be able to choose the adjacent uh, bands so that you can avoid that local noise problem if required. And of course, QRM is one of the things. If you wind up uh, your pre-planned frequency is uh, being used by somebody else, you may have to have a, an alternative standing by. So having that plan is really important. So agile operations. Uh, let me tell you a little story about that. Agile operations in one aspect is being able to tune your antenna uh, rapidly to the various bands. For decades, I resisted getting an automatic antenna tuner because I always felt that... Uh, uh, me tuning up the uh, antenna tuner to the band I was using was key to understanding how to how well the antenna works. Well, I have to admit, I finally bought an ant uh, automatic antenna tuner the other day, and it's great to be able to just switch bands, hit the tune button. Within a second, it's tuned up and things work. And I guess I'll just have to understand another way to whether or not my antenna uh, broke during the windstorm or whatever. But uh, uh, I'm, I'm really happy with the uh, automatic antenna tuners now. <laughs> so now I, I begin to recommend them. And anybody interested in a manual antenna tuner, I've got plenty of them, like uh, almost a dozen. Okay, moving on to, um, so having automatic antenna tuner is really key to uh, being agile. Antenna selection. Well, generally, uh, NV antennas are low, but not You'll see some uh, this load being carried to uh, probably unrealistic uh, lengths uh, by uh, some folks to actually put them on the ground or standing them on traffic cones. That may work. And uh, there's many factors we're dealing with here. And so whatever works for you is fine. But uh, I'm going to go through and talk a little bit about some of the quasi-theoretical uh, reasons for why we want to have an antenna at a specific height. So generally low, in other words, about a quarter wavelength at the highest frequency or that you're going to use or lower, horizontally polarized uh, because vertical antennas tend to have a null pointing directly up and you want to have your lobe pointing directly up. But if you can't have uh, an optimum antenna, use what you have because inevitably, even if it is vertical, it probably will work to some extent. Uh, a lot of the uh, radiation patterns we see in the handbook and uh, elsewhere are based on neck modeling, and modeling is great, but there are a lot of assumptions, particularly in regards to feed line radiation. Uh, they don't consider it, <laughs> particularly in regards to ground conductivity and water table depth. It's only grossly considered or not considered at all. And those things have as much to do with your radiation pattern as the antenna. And so uh, let's go on with some neck modeling. <laughs> 
and see what things look like. Okay, so a horizontal antenna, uh, ideally we'd want to put out a lobe like this pointing directly up to get that shower head uh, propagation effect. And uh, this reduces multipath. In other words, why does it reduce multipath? Well, you notice on the horizon, there is no lobe, there is no ground wave. And so the ground wave does not mix with the sky wave. Should, it, should that happen, mixed ground, ground wave and sky wave causes your signal to have constructive and deconstructive interference, which distorts your signal and makes it well, a little bit harder to understand. But in case of digital operations, particularly Winlink peer-to-peer, for example, or FL Digi modes, you'll see uh, selective fading where the signal might not drop, drop out entirely and you lose characters, or you'll have to do a repeat request in the case of Winlink VARA. So uh, that's what we would like to have, but uh, that can be uh, challenging to achieve uh, given your situation. Uh, I have a, a inverted V in a palm tree and it's up about a quarter wavelength uh, at 40 meters. And uh, so it works pretty well as a uh, uh, anti uh, NVIS antenna, which hopefully puts out something fairly similar uh, to this. Here is something for an antenna that might be too high. And uh, this shows a good vertical lobe, but it also has lower elevation lobes. And so this enables NVIS operations, but it's susceptible to multipath and distant noise interference. Yes, those uh, folks out in Texas or somewhere in the south coming through, including their thunderstorms, uh, that all adds noise and uh, background interference to uh, your communications channel. Uh, whereas what you really care about is this lobe pointing directly up here. Uh, but this enables it and allows you to operate. And that's the key thing. And you can put up with the interference. It's not the end of the world. This is probably the worst antenna for NVIS, which would be typical of a vertical antenna having a hole uh, at high elevation angles and lots of good radiation uh, down low, good for DX, but not good for NVIS. But you notice there is some radiation. It doesn't completely go away. So for years, I used a vertical antenna and a lot of what I was doing was actually NVIS. And I reiterate again, this is all based on neck modeling. I would not taking into account where the radials are, how long they are, what the ground conductivity is, blah, blah, blah. Uh, all those can distort your radiation pattern and give you unexpected uh, coverage that you might not know about, particularly feed line radiation. So uh, we talked about the multipath, and here are examples from some FL Digi um, waterfalls showing the uh, effect of the ground wave and the sky wave mixing, causing these bands across there. Uh, and this is fairly severe, and this is fairly light. Uh, interestingly, uh, during the day, we've talked a lot about the F2 layer here, but there's also an F1 layer that exists during the daylight. It's uh, roughly uh, 50 or 100 miles below the F2 layer. And it's less dense, but it can also reflect. And during the day, you can actually see F1 and F2 uh, signal paths mixing together, creating this uh, similar uh, distortion here. So <laughs> uh, it's not always the ground wave and sky wave mixing. Sometimes it's the F1 path and the F2 path mixing. Uh, I've been noticing that here lately. So some examples of NVIS antennas, horizontal loop antennas for mobile use, these half loop antennas. There's an Australian company that makes these. They're mighty expensive, but if you have a $100,000 Mercedes SUV, uh, the cost of the antenna is uh, peanuts. And of course, that's uh, a lot of the uh, governmental agencies and non-governmental organizations use uh, these kinds of setups like in the outback and uh, in the, uh, uh, like Sudan and places like that where there is no communications infrastructure and they use NVIS operations for HF NVIS for their communications links. A standard antenna that the uh, Army and Marine Corps uses is the AS2259 uh, antenna. It's a basically a pair of inverted Vs joined at the middle. 
uh, and put atop a uh, aluminum mast that is actually a piece of coax. It's aluminum mast with a piece of tubing running down the middle. Uh, the outside of it is the shield and the inside of it is a center conductor. Uh, obviously, that's if you have one of these, that's great. You can use that. But if, if you don't, uh, you can easily build one of these. Just uh, use a different kind of feed line without uh, uh, trying to find that uh, aluminum tubing uh, coax line. I use a 450 ohm uh, feeder line and just use the antenna tuner to uh, bring it into match with my uh, transceiver. Now you can Google the AS2259 and see lots of uh, lots of articles regarding that. And the idea of having two inverted Vs joined together like that is to give you the coverage on the major NVIS band. So the primary ones you want to do are 80, 60, and 40 meters. The ones on the uh, 160 and the 30 meter bands are, are uh, fairly marginal, although here during the uh, high sunspot cycle, 30 meters is absolutely useful. Uh, and I'll talk more about uh, some of the frequencies we use uh, a little later on here. Magnetic loops, uh, you can build your own full uh, loop, not just the half loop that I showed from the uh, NGOs, but uh, this Volkswagen van with the, the loop on top of it here is a pretty neat idea. The problem is with these kinds of loops is that they're very narrow bandwidth. And so uh, uh, they're really useful for things like FT8 or single frequency operation. But if you're trying to tune around the band and use the frequencies, uh, uh, adapting it to uh, across the band can be interesting. Motor tunable vacuum variable capacitors are one way to overcome that. Uh, dollars are involved, though. <laughs> More dollars than you may want to pay. Invert inverted Vs. Um, uh, this is, uh, I, I talk about the 87 and a half foot on the side uh, inverted V. This is my favorite field day antenna which we uh, would set up at the park for our field day at uh, Kearney Mesa Rec Center Park, where the activity day is gonna be on the 29th of April. Hope to see you there. And um, just uh, 87 and a half foot on the side and fed with 450 ohm line going in the antenna tuner. And you can match 160 meters uh, or any of the other NVIS bands are all the way up to 10 meters. Uh, for home use, this is uh, too big of an antenna, so I have one that's basically a junior version of this, and it's called the ZS6BKW, ZS6BKW antenna. It's roughly half the size of that, and that fits on my lot just fine, and it works from 80 meters on up. Uh, the ZS6BKW antenna is a variant of the G5RV. Uh, G5RV was developed early in the days, and a lot of the modeling programs were not available. And uh, as things advanced, uh, there were some shortcomings seen in the G5 RV. So the ZF6 BKW uh, formula was developed and um, uh, for better performance. And so that's why we use that one. What are the, what are the pros use? Uh, there's all kinds of big antennas like this uh, corkscrew antenna on the, on the right side. And this vertically oriented uh, log periodic antenna here. And of course, this is the double inverted V we spoke of in the, in the half loop antenna over the vehicle. Oops, went the wrong way. Okay, uh, as to the debate about how high the antenna should be, this little chart here from the field manual, Army Field Manual 24 TAC 18, uh, talks to uh, comparing antennas at various heights and their uh, signal strengths, both in a clear area in underneath a 75 foot high uh, forest. And this could be a little uh, informative on how the antenna works. So you can uh, just uh, Google that 20, uh, field manual 24-18 about NVIS and you'll come up with the same chart. And you can uh, do your own comparisons there about the antennas you might be contemplating to use. And But one thing that's remarkable down here at the bottom is how poorly a whip antenna <laughs> works for NVIS. Whereas uh, the dipole here is um, roughly at, at 15 feet is basically at minus 0 0.4 dB, which is uh, a real good signal. The 10 foot whip, which would be characteristic of a mobile whip is minus 21. So you lose uh, 21 dB basically uh, of signal. Well, that's, that's three S units or maybe a, a bit more than that. 
that's a pretty significant hit. So that's why uh, using an NVIS tailored antenna is a, a key element of success. And this one talks about um, the optimum antenna height. And you'll notice that uh, down here at the lowest heights, uh, signal levels drop way off. So getting it up somewhere around a tenth to a quarter wavelength above the ground is uh, recommended. The lower you get to the ground, the higher the ground losses are, and you get uh, lose your signal. However, at the same time, uh, the, the noise part of the signal to noise ratio, you may be getting rid of your noise. So it's, it's one of those things, trial and error, make a big deal, uh, big difference. So you may want to uh, try it way down low. But as far as purely the amount of radiated signal level, uh, getting the antenna up some height above ground to get away from the ground losses is good. What you're kind of, uh, sort of doing with the antenna is you have the antenna and then you have the ground below it acting as a two element uh, Yagi antenna pointing straight up. And this chart here shows um, For example, the optimum with the reflector would be about 0.15 wavelengths, but it uh, trails off slowly. So uh, somewhere in here, like or say around 0 0.25, 0 0.3, down to about 0.1 is hunky-dory. If you get too low and you lose your signal considerably. So the thing is about the ground, as I said, you don't know where the effective height or depth is of the reflecting part of the ground. Is it on the surface? Well, no, it's not. <laughs> is it down two feet? Probably not. Uh, the adage for many years was, is that normally a uh, nominal ground, whatever that is, uh, is that the reflecting area would be uh, down about six feet down, but I don't see any scientific evidence to back that up. So uh, caveat mTOR. So proficiency, practice, 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 join the nets, participate. Uh, we do have our nets on um, on Sunday morning. Uh, for the digital net, we are now running on 7072 kilohertz. And uh, during the low sunspot cycles, we'll be on 3572 kilohertz and maybe 60 meters in between. And of course the voice net, we're uh, using both uh, 75 meters 3905 kilohertz and 60 meters channel 153.5 kilohertz to uh, experience the NVIS uh, operations there. And um, the bottom bullet there is you can't participate in the net. A lot of folks are listening in on the Kiwi SDRs uh, now. They're readily available on the internet and you can uh, hear uh, how that works. Uh, some of those Kiwi SDRs are using vertical antennas, so they aren't very good NVS receivers. Some of those Kiwi SDRs have lots of local noise, so you may not hear things well. Other ones do have good NVIS antennas like G5RVs and other inverted Vs, and uh, they work pretty well. Once again, trial and error, check it out, gain some experience. So for NVIS operations, as I say, there's some need for agility. And automatic link establishment, or ALE, may be one of the solutions to making that happen uh, without having to uh, gain lots of experience or operator training. The radio figures it out for you. What it does is it probes pre-selected frequencies and uh, establishes a sounding link between you and your intended uh, correspondent at the distant end, and it automatically figures out what the best frequency is to uh, establish your communications. So uh, that's kind of neat. Uh, when I originally built this brief back in 2014, uh, it was theoretical. I've now uh, been operating the ALE now for about the last almost a year, and I've uh, been able to learn some things from that. We'll talk about that here soon. So now we're gonna get into the updates. Uh, I promised the spacew.com uh, uh, FOF2 charts are um, either out of date or not available anymore. Uh, so these from the Australian uh, Space Agency, Space Weather uh, Agency, are really useful. And you can see instead of just being contour lines, they're actually bands. And up on the top here, the color code for each of the frequency ranges. 
So this light blue is uh, six megahertz. So when it goes from green to blue, that's six megahertz there. And then when it goes from light blue to the next color, that's seven megahertz. So halfway in between is about six and a half megahertz. It's all rather crude. These are based on ionospheric soundings. This is uh, many institutions and governments operate these ionospheric sounders, which uh, sweep across the HF band and send the signal straight up and map the ionosphere up above. And from that, they can calculate these charts. The way where I get mine, uh, you might want to take down this web address, uh, hamqsl.com slash solar3.html, and it gives you these charts. You might want to take a picture or a screenshot of that. Or this brief will be up, and uh, you can just steal it off the brief after the presentation. So this is uh, one for earlier this week. And with our high sunspot cycle, our FOF2 is at 12 and a half megahertz. So we could use 30 meters, for example, for uh, NVIS propagation. But you see it goes all the way up here to 15, 16 megahertz right there, even a little bit more than 16 megahertz. It's interesting to see. Um, this is this, of course, this, this uh, profile here where the FOF2 increases, tracks with the sun uh, during the course of the day. And you'll see uh, as the day changes, it will go west following the sun. Kind of neat. And alternately, looking at the uh, nighttime part of the day over here, uh, got much lower frequencies. And so the brown is 3 megahertz. And this little yellow spot is 2 megahertz. So this would be a case where only 160 meters would work for NVIS in that area. Like I say, we're up around 200 uh, uh, sunspot number right now. So uh, everything's going to be elevated during the low sunspot periods of the cycle. Uh, you'll see this go down to red, one megahertz, which is we don't have a hand band <laughs> down there other than the 630 meter band, which very few of us operate. So uh, uh, unlikely that you're going to be able to do NVIS there. As I mentioned earlier, it's as much about noise as it is about propagation, and automatic link establishment can help you with that. Yes, one of the things I've learned about uh, automatic link establishment since I've been using it is that uh, uh, the, you really can ride that critical frequency pretty closely and still get communications. I've been doing NVIS on uh, outside the amateur band of the Coast Guard Auxiliary uh, using uh, nine megahertz frequencies uh, between here and Orange County and uh, Ontario and places like that, Ontario, California, not uh, not Canada. And uh, the nine megahertz works really well. And uh, uh, 10, uh, 10 and 14 megahertz up to uh, uh, Lake Tahoe. Uh, it's been kind of neat. And I wouldn't have really gotten a good handle on this without having ALE because I can agilely go between the frequencies uh, with great ease. And of course that automatic antenna tuner helps a lot too. So. Uh, ALE is a neat thing. Some references, which I'll uh, attempt to read off. There's that field manual and some uh, experiments and so on. Take a picture or pull the brief down uh, after we uh, post it. And last but not least, you participated in this meeting today. Please put your ICS-214 alpha in and send it to the JAF6GM at winlink.org. And that concludes my brief. Are there any questions? N1TEN. Go ahead, Dennis. Yeah, uh, in talking about uh, the effect of the uh, the actual ground under the antenna, uh, do you anticipate that uh, when we get uh, rainstorms through that that uh, improves uh, NVIS? Well, I know for sure it will improve the ground wave. Um, well, and it's been interesting that uh, Dave, uh, WB Success QA, is uh, uh, very reliably reports exactly what his S meter tells me, each 75 meter ARES net and uh, the 60 meter check in as well, between his house in the University City and my house here in Claremont. And it's interesting to see how it varies 
uh, from week to week. And yes, the rain does appear to make a difference. It seems to enhance things. Uh, <laughs> Uh, weather makes a difference, more so than I thought. You know, we we're all sort of brought up that space weather, the ionosphere, in other words, was the main uh, contributing factor. But yes, even down at HF, the weather makes some difference. So, uh, yeah, thanks for that question. Thank you, Bill. Well, thanks. That's all I have. <clears throat> I got one quick question. Yes, sir. Chris uh, KN six QXE. Hey, those uh, loop antennas mounted on the vehicles. Those are those going to work if they're rotated ninety degrees flat, or does that more like a a Yagi with a driver and a reflector that kind of basically directionally points straight up? Well, um, yeah, I don't think that it really acts as a um, as a reflector because the spacing is uh, so close. Uh, like I say, to act as a reflector, it needs to be on the order of probably no closer than about a tenth of a wavelength. And so that would be uh, eight meters for an 80 meter antenna, which is you know, 25 feet or so. Um, yeah, I, I don't remember looking at that particular, I, I think that puts the uh, overhead, uh, gives you a null looking overhead. That's why they stand those uh, loops on the edge because that gives you a, a lobe overhead. So uh, I think uh, it's not working so well, but uh, doing the modeling or uh, trying it out uh, is always worthwhile to see what you get. Okay, then. I have a uh, question, comment maybe. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, the ham literature classically never talks about uh, NVIS above 40 meters. And you, you obviously, from your experience, it's entirely possible. And those of us interested in uh, emergency communications <laughs> better start investigating it. But their reasoning is when you go above 40 meters, that signal going straight up has a high probability of punching straight through the, uh, the uh, ionosphere, the F2 layer, and going out into space. <coughs> On some of your uh, charts, you show that there is a fringe area where you it doesn't it it doesn't do anything near the transmitter, but there's a large fringe area on the outer bands, and that's really because it's kissing off the ionosphere at a little bit of an angle and not punching through. So it, it is possible to use NVIS uh, primarily at the at the uh, outer bands, as you showed on your graphs. If if I understood what you were showing. Oh, uh, yes, uh, that, that is exactly what we're showing is that um, the, the key issue is that the higher bands, uh, roughly 17 meters and shorter, um, is that the uh, there is a skip zone that develops and so close in you don't get return uh, levels. And, and that really is what we're defining NVIS as is being able to get the sky wave in, in close with uh, no skip zone. And so, yes, the higher bands, you do get a skip zone because, as you say, it uh, punches right through. The reason we're seeing uh, higher bands being useful right now is because we're in an unusually high level of sol solar activity. And typically going um, in frequencies higher than 10 megahertz is not likely to be successful. But during the high parts of the solar cycle, uh, expect the unexpected. And like I say, uh, some years ago, I had a loop antenna. I was experimenting with a 17 meter uh, WSPR mode. And for some reason I was getting into Borrego Springs reliably every afternoon. And what it was is uh, you'll see that the sun uh, UV radiation comes down and ion, ion, ionizes the ionosphere, but it sort of lags behind the sun roughly an hour or so. So the peak time for the maximum frequency that you're going to be able to use for NVIS will actually peak at about two to or one to two or so in the afternoon, uh, real time, not daylight savings time, by the way. Um, and so during those periods of time for about an hour or two, I could get into Borrego Springs on 17 meters because it was uh, that high. But it's not something you would want to rely on. And that's why it's really important to have... Uh, agility to be able to change your bands and adapt to the ionosphere conditions and of course being aware of them either through the use of ALE or having the uh, uh, FOF2 charts available to you. Hi Craig here. Hi Craig. So uh, many of you know I have a fairly decent signal on a campo here 
side by share. <clears throat> uh, my primary antenna is a horizontal window fan dipole. But unlike most fan dipoles, instead of one element being over the other, both elements are at the same height and the 80 meter is offset about uh, 50 degrees from the 160 meter element. So I have a 160 meter element and an 80 meter element. And with any tuner, since the highest is where it's 2.9 on 160, I think it's because it's too close to the ground. Pardon me while I scratch. <laughs> uh, I, can, I can tune any frequency from 160 to 10 meters. And uh, so I haven't changed any antennas since I set that one up. And uh, also I notice uh, many times on Sunday, as we know, the 60 meter works better than the 80 meter. Yes, I agree. And uh, yes, you do have a good signal in, in into Claremont from, <laughs> from your uh, QTH there in Campo. Uh, so uh, I'll test your antenna is working well. And once again, it's a horizontal antenna. How high is it up, Craig? Uh, the center poles at 47 feet and the ends are at 20. Okay. Okay. So you're up there, but not really super high up. So you aren't running the risk of uh, losing your uh, high angle uh, radiation. So yeah, sounds like a good NVIS antenna and covers all the frequencies. Okay, so Charger F. Hi, Rob. Go ahead. At uh, Quartzfest, Red Cross had on display uh, an HF antenna, Envis, is a folded dipole, and it looked like a volleyball net set up uh, straight across, same height as a volleyball net, uh, extra long. They needed support in the middle, but uh, it covered all bands, and uh, uh, it, you had to you had to duck under it in order to get under it. But the top of the uh, of the folded dipole was about the same height as a uh, uh, as a volleyball net. So uh, I'm fascinating to look at. Yes, let me explain that antenna a little bit. I saw that while I was there. That's known as a T2 FD antenna. And uh, they are large, expensive, and a little uh, ungainly, but uh, they do uh, work. And what they are is a, a terminated folded dipole. That's what the uh, T2 FD stands for, terminated folded dipole. And uh, they have a resistor uh, you know, a folded dipole is two wires, one at the bottom broken, and uh, there's where the feed line goes. And opposite the feed line on the upper wire is uh, something on the order of a 450 or 600 ohm resistor, uh, which eats up some of your power, but it does prevent the impedance from uh, going through great excursions, causing great uh, SWR uh, to occur. High levels of SWR is probably a better term. So uh, they're very useful for uh, doing ALE uh, because it uh, decreases the work your tuner has to do to switch from frequency to frequency. And they may work all the bands, including every in between the bands between 80 meters on up or 160 meters on up, depending on the version you buy or build. Uh, now that is the antenna, what, what the theory is there. Uh, a lot of government agencies, and I, I probably should have included that antenna in here because so many are using that kind of antenna. Uh, once again, because it's easy to uh, uh, tune up and, and load into uh, uh, decreasing the operator uh, uh, proficiency demands of, of using that antenna. A lot of non-governmental agencies and governmental agencies use that. Uh, I will remark, however, that at that Alt, uh, height above ground uh, that uh, was shown there in Quartzfest. Yes, I too uh, ducked under it, did the limbo under the antenna, that it um, probably had pretty high ground losses. So uh, that's one consideration in that particular uh, location that uh, you might want to watch out for that in addition to dissipating probably close to half of your power in that resistor, uh, that you're also going to be dissipating some of your power at the uh, low height above the ground. Of course, at Quartzfest, the ground is very dry. Who knows where the actual effective ground is? It may be <laughs> maybe 10, 20, 30 feet down below. So it probably might have worked just fine in, in that circumstance. So um, those are some of my thoughts on that. Anything else? No, thank you. Sure. Last call. Otherwise, I've done. All right, any other questions?
All right, thanks, Bill. Uh, are you going to provide the slides to uh, Rob as well? Sure, I'll send them to Rob, and Rob can post them on the uh, on the group's website or wherever. Over. All right, that way you can get those uh, links for that uh, you have in there for those who did not get them written down quickly enough, and uh, everybody will be covered. So, is there any other business for the net this morning? Bruce, uh, Rob, do you have anything else to add this morning? Not for me. Good on my side as well. If there's additional questions, let's wrap it up. All right, sounds good. If there are no other questions, we'll go ahead and uh, end the meeting. And uh, Rob will get this posted on uh, online as soon as the uh, processing completes. And uh, so anybody who missed it can uh, catch up with it. So if there are no further questions, I'll go ahead and uh, close the meeting. Thank you all for being here, and uh, we'll talk to you on the nets.